Great. Okay. <clears throat> As Lars says, my name is George Dunlap, and I work for Citrix on the, the open source Zen team. And I've been the release coordinator for 4.3, and uh, also been volunteering for that for 4.4. So um, I'm going to be giving uh, an update on the development stuff and what's been going on. So to begin with, uh, we have a lot of new people to the community. And uh, I, just from interacting on the list and face-to-face -face in a couple of uh, the last things, I think there's been, um, it, it would be good to go over again what the development principles are for uh, the Oro Open Source Project and how we run it and why. Um, not only for the new people, but also just kind of a good reminder for the people who have been here a while to um, make sure that we're all on the right track. So we're going to start by um, going over some principles of OSF development in kind of a high level. And then we're going to uh, look at the, how, those, how we try to apply those into the Zen development process, what the actual specific kind of um, standard operating procedures that we use. Um, and then we're going to uh, have a review of the 4.3 development process and how that went. And um, we're going to go into 4.4. And then we're going to finally going to have a number of project updates for individual projects. Uh, so these will include EFI, network drivers, FreeBSD, uh, liver integration, NUMA. And one thing that's missing here is also the, uh, a short update on the block drivers. OK. So to begin with, um, one of the things I think is economically great about open, open source from a business perspective um, apart from the, just the fun of actually working with other really cool developers and things like that, is that it's a force multiplier, right? So all the people that we use then, we could separately hire people to implement our own separate hypervisors, but that would be a huge waste of time. And the result wouldn't be nearly as good as with all of us working together. So Citrix is one of the, um, one of, one of the largest uh, contributors to Zen.org. And we only contribute, I think, maybe about a third of the total code or less, right? I mean, if you include Linux and Zen. Yeah, then it's less than a third of the total code. And what that means is that Citrix is hiring n number of people, but they're getting 3n amount of developer, uh, total developer effort out of contributing to the open source project. And this is one of the things I think from a business perspective is great about Zen. But there's one thing that will limit that, and that is trust. So whenever anyone comes to any kind of a project, um, trust is a fundamental thing, um, factor about all relationships. Um, and, but in particular with open source, because <clears throat> if you're coming and you're going to invest a lot of time in contributing code, um, at, either as an individual or as a company, contributing code, um, uh, contributing your time to help people on a mailing list or promote Zen um, or anything like that, um, in, in building your infrastructure on Zen, um, there's a risk, of course, that something will happen that you have invested all this time and then it's not going to pay off, right? The direction, the, the um, project may take a strategic direction that doesn't include you, and now you've spent this time, um, and it's not going to it's not going to pay off, right? And so, you can't uh, get rid of all risks in life. I mean, right, life is inherently a risk, but we can do things to try and reduce that risk. So, one of the goals that we have for the Zen project is we want it to be a meritocracy. We want as much as possible for um, your ability to influence the project to depend on one how good your contributions are, um, how good your code is, or how good your ideas are for the pro project as a whole, and two, how much you have contributed to the project yourself, so, or, or as a company. So we want it to be the case that if you invest a lot of time and energy giving to the project, no matter who you are, no matter what company you're from, then you can expect that your uh, desires and your needs will be taken into consideration when we uh, make strategic decisions about the project. Okay, so this thing about having a meritocracy in order to increase the trust so that more people can contribute to Zen and feel comfortable contributing to Zen knowing that they're going to get a payoff um, is the underlying thing that underlies a lot of the kind of the day-to-day -day things and, and ways in which we run the project. So how that comes into practice and code development um, uh, is this. So all patches that go to Zen have to be posted to the list, no matter who you're from, no matter what, what company you're from, okay? And then um, on the list, we have a discussion. And I, the ideal for Zen is that, all, um, is that all discussions should end in a consensus. So everyone on the list comes to a consensus that says, this is fine, therefore, this code is, um, is OK to be checked in. And sometimes a consensus, if it's a really obvious patch or a really small thing, it's a really bug fix, and no one has any objections, a consensus can just be, meh, looks good to me. Right, the end. And if no one objects, then we have consensus, right? Now, we have a small number of people who are committers. 
And the committers have an official kind of elected position. There's a, there's a, a particular role in which you can, um, th there's a path where anyone can um, come and become a committer. Um, I mean, it's, it's a long path because it's a very high, uh, important position and a thing. But it's not only about being this company or that company, okay? And the committers essentially act as referees. So they're there to determine when consensus has happened about a piece, about a patch, uh, a piece of code. And if a consensus is not achieved, is a, um, sometimes it's just not possible to achieve, then it's the goal of the, the job of the committers to um, make a decision which is in the best interest of the community as a whole. Okay? So that's how code, and, and even if you're a committer, you still have to submit your own patch to the list and have them subjected to the same peer review process and um, the same consensus making process. Quick question. Yeah. I can't remember that we had to add break ties really ever. Well, you know, there have only been a few instances, right? Well, so in the case of, um, so this is about code, yeah. right? So it's not actually infrequent that one person says, I think we should do it this oh, way. Okay. Another person says, I think we should do it that way. And it's just a, sometimes, usually it's just a matter of, okay, someone has to make a decision, so we're just going to do it this way, okay? Um, I mean, it, it's the, one of, kind of the nice thing about, I think, open source is you get lots of opinions. We're all opinionated. You can just go and say, I think this is a dumb idea. I think we should do it this way. And everyone can, can say that, and then we can all happily um, still get along uh, for the most part. <laughs> um, but it's, because we have the committers, and they're in charge eventually of just saying, you know, we're just going to do it this way, um, then... Yeah, there's not a terrible amount of politicking and things like that. Okay, so this is about the code development. And in practice, um, for bigger decisions about the direction of the project, the process is actually fairly similar, a kind of the same basic idea writ large, okay? So um, obviously we have individual discussions on a one-on-one -on -one basis or things like that, but ultimately all the major decisions that have to affect the, the project as a whole have to happen on the mailing list. Um, and our goal for those is that there should be a consensus. Okay, so anyone, if you have an idea, if you, if you think you have an idea for the best way that the project should be run, you can come and you can contribute to that discussion, and if, you have a good, if your ideas are good and you're able to convince people, then you can have influence over the project. And if you have contributed a lot to the project, you can expect that your desires and your needs will be um, taken into account when we make those decisions. And so we're going to, um, we aim for consensus, um, but if in the case that we can't get a consensus, then um, we have a process to fall back to, and that's just the committers. And it's the job of the committers to um, try and make a, a, a decision which is good for the project as, as a whole. Right. And so the, 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 go the reason we have all these different rules like this is, again, so that you can trust, um, to help, help you to trust the system, um, to make it, you more comfortable contributing to it. Right. <clears throat> so when it comes to releases, okay, so now switching gears a bit, um, we started the, this kind of release management process. We're not, we're not big process people. We don't really like to have lots of little things that go on. But we found that um, not having a process at all um, led to some kind of problems. So for Zen 4.2, it was about a, a year and a half in production. And part of that was because there was just no one in charge to say, hey, let's you know, make a release now. And when a year had passed and we said, OK, maybe it's time for a release, then we looked at the things and said, actually, this is in no state to be released. Because um, no one had been tracking and saying, what do we actually need to make to the release? How far are we away? And it was yet another six months of cleaning up um, and getting to the point where we wanted to be able to release before we could actually do the release. So what we want from the release process is a visibility into wor the work that's going on. Okay? So a lot of, there's a huge number of people who are actually working on Zen in, in different ways. But often we don't see each other because we don't see each other face to face. It's not clear that there actually is that work going on, right? And until someone posts a patch series. And so if, um, if you post the patch and it takes six months or nine months or a year to, to, to get the basic thing out, um, you just don't see that and you can't see that anyone else is working on it. So we want a visibility into work that's going on so that we can kind of see each other and be encouraged so that other people outside the project can see what's going on. And also to make sure that we are um, uh, working together, uh, that um, no one is uh, duplicating effort. We want to have, be able to have a clear picture of the state that everything is in so that we can make a good decision about where to spend our time and effort um, and uh, when a release is a good, it's a good time to do a release. Um, and we also want to have a, a keep a roadmap of important features. Uh, there's always a, a million good things that it would be good to do, um, much more than um, we, we can have uh, developer time to do right now. Um, and it's always that case. That that's a really good thing. That you have a growing project. Um, and so but we want to be able to keep track of all the features that we think are good so that at any given time we can kind of look at the whole picture and say, 
are we right now doing the, the most important thing that we, that we can be doing? And so that other people coming to the project, and they say, hey, I want to contribute, what can I do? We have a big list here we can say, well, this is something that we've been wanting to do for a while. It seems like it's pretty bite-sized. Why don't you take a stab at it? Um, and we also, of course, want good releases. And a good release is defined by three factors. Um, one, it should be bug-free. Two, it should be awesome for whatever awesome means, right? So having good features, um, fast, uh, all, all the things that make a Zen awesome. Um, and thirdly, it's important, but less important than the other two, is it should be on time. So this is the, the order in which we sort of evaluate things. First of all, it should be bug-free. Second of all, it should be awesome. Third, it should be on time and it released in a timely manner. So the mechanism by which we kind of do this is we keep a list of outstanding features and bugs. Um, the release coordinator does that, so I do that. Um, these are things that are actively worked on in the moment and the things that we think would be good to work on. Um, and then every few weeks, I just send the, uh, the list to this list of things to the mailing list. Um, if there's updates then I, uh, that, I, that I see, that have seen in the development process, then I add that in. And other people, as they're doing updates, will respond to that and say, this is where I am in, in the project. I'm still working on it. It's done. It's almost done, and, and so on. Um, and we have a mirror on the wiki. And I haven't had time today to make sure this is in sync. But I think this should be within, in sync with the, the most recent one. Um, uh, yes. So release phases. Um, we begin with, uh, when we open the development, anything can be checked in. Okay, if, it's, if the maintainer thinks that it's ready, you can submit to the patch and it can be checked in. At some point, we'll do a feature freeze, and that means no new features, which have not been discussed before, will be accepted. And the idea here is that if you submit a patch before the feature freeze, but there are just a handful of comments, you know, uh, about tweaking it or changing it, um, then you still have some time um, to actually get it cleaned up and get in before the actual feature freeze. So there's three weeks of no new features. And then after that, we have something called a code freezing point. And at this point is when we, we begin rejecting features. And this is, we start to try and do a cost benefits analysis, right? So every time we accept a new feature, there's a risk that we may find a bug in it, which will cause it to slip the release, making us not have an on-time release. Um, and uh, there's a risk that we won't find the bug, that there will be a bug that we won't find, and then we'll release a buggy um, project. Um, so we have to balance the how much better does this make Zen versus where is the risk of um, slipping the release or having bugs. Um, and then it becomes more and more strict for the next three weeks, and then we begin doing um, release candidates. Um, and once you, the first release candidate is actually a candidate. So if we discover that there were actually no bugs in RC0 or RC1, then we could just release that. In practice, that almost never happens, and typically we, um, it takes us about six weeks to reach a point where um, we think we can release a project. And again, near the end of that, near the beginning of the RCs, any bug fix will probably be accepted. Um, near the end of it, um, we again, be, again begin doing the cost benefits analysis so that um, a, uh, if, if the fix is, is a fix of a relatively minor bug and it's very invasive in a way that it may cause other bugs, then we may reject it even though it is a bug fix um, to make sure that the, that the project, that the ultimate release is as good as we can make it. Okay. <clears throat> Right, so this is a very long talk. Um, so I thought I would break it up a little bit by um, adding a few things in here. So um, I'm going to try telling a joke. <laughs> so there were two ducks. Th this is a, a joke that I actually read in French, but it translates very well to, to any language. So there were two ducks, and they're swimming down the, the river. Um, and then one duck says, quack, quack. And the other duck says, dang, I was just going to say that. OK. Right, you can laugh at me and not with me. Okay. <laughs> right, so how did 4.3 go? All right, so our goal was to have um, a nine-month release cycle. Uh, this, the scheduled release would have been June 2013. Um, as it turned out, the actual release is in July 2013. So we slipped by about three weeks, I think. And the reason for that, the main reason for that was that there were some security um, issues that we found where the um, disclosure was going to be July, early July. And we thought, it would be silly to like release, um, you know, at the end of June, and then one week later or two weeks later say, oh, by the way, there was a bunch of bugs in that one. Um, here, take this update. So we decided to slip the release. Um, and then uh, after that, we slipped another release for basically marketing reasons. Um, uh, so I think overall we did a very good job um, with the release. And there were no sort of howlers, no really terrible, awful bugs that, uh, that I'm aware of. Um, so overall, I think as far as the release thing, things went pretty well. Um, 
Now, as far as um, sort of looking into the future, I, I'm, I'm not sure why, you know, I thought this would be different for me, right? But like you sort of have the temptation when you start doing this stuff to say, to make predictions and say, I have this crystal ball. And so we looked at all the things that we were doing and I kind of had this, um, a big list of things that I started up here last year and I said, these are all these amazing things that I think we can probably get done in the next nine months. Um, and uh, you can see a big, I'm not going to go, go through them here, but um, <clears throat> in January, I kind of did a mid, uh, Thing evaluation. Um, I posted a blog and said, well, you know, so some of the things, the PV Audio, Block Tap 3, a couple of those things um, we're probably not going to get to, but most of everything else I think we're going to we're, we're get to. It should be really good. And in addition, we have these other things that were not on the original list, but it turns out people were, uh, were working on, right? And so I made this prediction that we're going to have this amazing release with all these features in it. And of course, when the release came, there was a huge number of things that, you know, didn't make it. Um, there are a very large number of things that did make it, so that, you know, that is great. But, um, but, I mean, the ultimate thing is I've learned, as a million people have also learned, that you just don't try and predict um, exactly what's going to happen for when things are going to be done for software. <coughs> um, nonetheless, uh, so for 4.4, uh, we have, we've, decided to ha try and have experiment with a shorter release cycle. So we're going to try a six-month release cycle. Um, the feature freeze has just passed. Uh, the scheduled feature freeze would be the eight 18th of October. Um, the code freeze originally was scheduled for about um, three weeks after that, so early November. Um, but we have uh, a fairly large number of, of um, items that are on the list that we think probably could be accepted um, if we slip the code freeze a bit. Um, and so we have decided to slip the code freeze by a few weeks to hope that we can get those things in. Um, and then uh, we're hoping to have the, um, uh, the, the original release was planned for late January. Um, so it may be late January, early February when we have the, the next release. Okay, so things that look likely. Um, there's a couple things that are done. Multi-vector MSI, um, improved SPI support. So I don't know if, um, uh, Sorry, his, so the, the guy's been working on Spice. Is, is he here? No? Okay. There's a, anyway, there's a guy been working on the Spice support. It's been really good. Um, there's a potential we'll have PVH for DOM use, or perhaps still an experimental um, form. Um, one important feature is non UDEV scripts for driver domains. And this sounds like a kind of a complicated feature, but what it allows you to have is uh, UDEV is what we use which, um, to set up a lot of the connections and stuff, um, but it's Linux only. And so, uh, right now, driver domains can only be, you can only have Linux driver domains, even if you have a NetBSD or FreeBSD uh, DOM zero. And so, having the non udev scripts for driver domains allows you to have any other VM to be able to be a driver domain. We've got a ton of fixes from the Kaveri reports, as uh, Lars mentioned. Um, we should be able to have NUMA per vCPU affinity checked in. Um, and uh, hopefully, I'm still hoping with this one, USB hot plug for LibXL, but we'll see what happens. Again, these are predictions. Uh, these are things we kind of hope, but I'm not going to say with any confidence that these are actually going to get in. Um, okay. So now let's go to the per um, project updates. So EFI, if you're not familiar with it, it's, it's a new kind of replacement for BIOS. BIOS was written back in the DOS days, I think. And so this is kind of a um, rewrite of it. Um, it includes a bootloader-like functionality. So in, in theory, you, you could boot several different things without having to install a bootloader-like grub. Um, there, it provides boot time services, similar to BIOS calls, um, and it also provides secure boot services. And this has been a big thing. Um, I'm not going to go into detail about this, but you can look at Matthew Garrett's blog and some other things like that that um, will tell you about um, secure boot and Zen and the different issues with it. Uh, sorry, not Zen, but Linux and the different issues with it. Um, so this is an update from Daniel Kuiper, who's been working on this stuff from Oracle. So the basic EFI support was introduced in Zen uh, 4.2. Um, at the moment, um, you can only boot Zen. Um, and so again, I, I'm, as Lars mentioned, these are slides that were sent to me. Um, so if there's something on here or I'm interpreting something wrong or something is said that's wrong, please raise your hand and, and, and correct it. So I'm kind of, um, uh, yeah. So right now, you can only load EFI from uh, uh, you can only boot Zen from the EFI loader. Um, you can't boot Zen directly from Grub2 with, with, with EFI. However, there is a workaround. Um, apparently, you can use the EFI loader to boot Grub2 and Grub2 to boot fake BIOS and fake BIOS to do the chain load and the trade loader can then use um, Zen.EFI. Um, but they are working on um, Grub2 support. 
Um, and there's actually been a big um, discussion on the mailing list recently. So if you want to see what the state of that is, you can go to the Zen mailing list. Um, and so Qboot for, and one of the issues would be whether Zen and DOM0 can use secure boot from using Grub2. Um, and to begin with, they're just going to be able to boot from Grub2, um, and later they're going to have to make some changes to allow Zen to uh, run with secure boot. Um, so as far as DOM0 DOM kernel support, yes? Okay. Uh, all what is said there basically works in uh, SUSE three like degree with a couple of, of course, as we all know, uh, patches on top of uh, upstream graph two. Okay. So, um, so is, these are all not really uh, accurate. things that prevent things from working. Okay. So you're saying that um, with a few patches on Grub two then you can boot Zen um, on, under Grub2 with EFI um, and have access to the secure boot uh, um, functionality. Is that right? W with the um, uh, with the Zuzu kernel. That, that is independent. I mean, uh, the Zuzu kernel only requires all of the kernel sign support for EFI. Oh, sure, sure. Okay. 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 Um, right. So that's an update on that. Um, so as far as... Uh, so Zen... Booting under EFI is one thing, and the next thing is whether the DOM0 kernel can access the EFI, um, the EFI functionality, particularly the Zucubit functionality. Um, so uh, Zuzu, the, the Zenified Zuzu kernel, um, has had full support for EFI um, for some time now. Um, the upstream Linux kernel doesn't have EFI support um, for DOM0 when running under Zen. Um, and unfortunately, it looks like um, that began to be worked on, but there's no one working on it at the moment, um, and there's no, as far as, like, as I'm reading this, there's no um, ETA on when that might happen. Um, and then, so, it sounds related, but it's actually a very, from a code perspective, it's a completely different issue, and that is um, EFI guest support. Um, so, the Open Virtual Machine Firmware, or VMF, or also known as Tianacore, um, was tracked into Zen um, some time ago, but as of, I believe as of 4.3, um, there were some changes and it doesn't actually, as of 4.3, it didn't compile. Now these were sent to me, again, by Daniel Kuiper, and um, in the meantime, Wei Lu at Citrix has started working on Tianacore and gotten her to boot again. Is Wei here? Can he correct me on that? Oh, right. Is, is this correct? Yes. Okay. Um, however, there is still um, an outstanding issue um, having to do with frame buffers. I won't go into the details of that. Um, but at the moment, um, it, it, it doesn't quite work with the full functionality, but um, Wei has been working on that, and so we'll see whether that can be sorted out for 4.4 or not. Okay, are there any questions about, I think that's the last bit about EFI. Is there any questions about EFI guest support before we move on to the next thing? Okay, um, so network updates. And unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to, uh, to talk with Wei about exactly what some of these things meant. So these are kind of copied from a set of slides he gave me. So, so one of the first features is that um, rather than having one uh, uh, thread per vCPU, we now have one thread per VIF. Uh, so this is a lot more scalable and a lot more flexible. Um, split event channels. Uh, that's two event channels, one for TX and one for IX. Oh, right, right. So, so one event channel for send and one event channel for receive. Yeah. Okay. Um, features currently being worked on, um, IPv6 pack, packet offload. Um, new features planned, uh, multi-queue support and multi-page ring support, which should allow a deeper uh, pipeline and so on. Okay. Um, and if you, I guess if you, if you have more questions about uh, what these things mean, talk to, to Wade there in the back. Yeah, send <laughs> <laughs> Right. Okay, FreeBSD, um, there's been a lot of really cool things um, going on with FreeBSD. So um, in the 10.0 10 10 release, which should be released by the end of November, um, there's been a lot of technical work to um, enable more of the PV and PVH features. Um, so I'll kind of let you skim these. Um, using the PV event timers, PV IPIs, allowing live migration for PVH VM guests, um, uh, better support for block front stuff, um, and now, full support uh, in the, um, for the generic kernel. So then instead of having to recompile FreeBSD for 
to run on Zen. Now the same kernel can be run both on bare metal and on Zen. Um, and a lot of bug fixes uh, for a bunch of the different things. And this is, sorry, they got kind of got cut off there a bit. So there's been work done in conjunction with um, Spectra Logic and Citrix. Uh, stuff that's coming up with that. Um, so Roger has been working on the PVH guest support. So as soon as PVH is available in Zen, it should also be available in um, FreeBSD. Um, and also for PVH DOM0 support. So as soon as we get DOM0 support for um, PVH, uh, which is one of the big things that Oracle and Mukesh have been working on, um, then that should very quickly allow uh, FreeBSD to run as a DOM0, which is pretty exciting. Um, block improvements. We have persistent grants, which um, is a performance improvement. It allows you to, um, rather than unmapping and, unma mapping and unmapping things um, or copying, to, to allow the same to keep pages mapped. That's a performance improvement. And indirect descriptors. What was this? Uh, it allows you to have more, se more segments inside of each uh, request. More segments inside of each request, right, OK. So you can actually put more data in a similar way the preview. All right, OK. It's something similar to the multi-page preview without having multi-page preview. OK, so is it similar to a scatter-gather kind of idea? So you have a pointers to other things, OK. Right, so it's, again, a performance. Um, improvement allows a deeper pipeline. Um, libvirt, uh, so this is an update from Dario. Um, so the basic VM workflow, a lot of these things uh, work. So create, shut down, reboot, and so on. Um, migration and PCI pass through allegedly are uh, coming soon. Um, as far as advanced VM manipulation, a lot of the things actually are supported in libvirt. So scheduling, um, updating the memory, vCPUs, block attached, and so on. Um, a number of other advanced things uh, are not yet working, so VCPU pinning, NUMA known affinity, um, uh, and so on. So there's, there's still work that, 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 that can be done improving the uh, libvirt support. Um, and some specific things for libvirt which are not yet supported, so um, host and guest configuration and statistics apparently are not supported, um, and the block and network performance tuning control are, are also missing. Um, so if you are interested in using libvirt, um, I'm sure there's lots of, uh, lots of good things for you to, to do to, to help out. Um, NUMA, we've got a lot of stuff going on with NUMA. So um, first of all, there's NUMA automatic aware placement. So Zen has known about, been able to know somewhat about NUMA for, for quite a while. Um, as of 4.2, uh, we added code to allow you to automatically kind of take a look at how big your VM was and what the memory placement of the system was and automatically try and put your, um, uh, place your, uh, your VM so that the memory was all co-located in one smaller area, okay? In either one node or two nodes to, to maximize the performance that you could have. As of 4.3, we'll um, improve the scheduler, the credit one scheduler, to know about NUMA and so that you can say, so before that you had to do pinning. Um, so you could say, only run it on this node. So now you can say, well, this VM's um, uh, memory is all on, on this node or one of these nodes. So if you can, try and run it on this node. But if you can't, um, that node is just too busy, it's okay to run on, on a different node. Okay, so that's um, been there for 4.3. Um, something coming up for 4.4, hopefully, again, is the per vCPU, per vCPU NUMA aware scheduling. So in 4.3, um, the NUMA affinity is based on uh, is the entire domain. And for 4, we will allow that to have individual NUMA affinity for individual vCPUs. And this is important for virtual NUMA. So we want to be able to tell uh, the guest, look, you have two nodes, and these vCPUs are, uh, um, are close to this node. These vCPUs are close to this node. And so then we'll, we want to be able to tell Zen the same thing. OK, so. Um, this VM has memory across two nodes. Please run these vCPUs close to on this node. Please run these VPs on this node if possible. Um, other things coming up, as we said, virtual NUMA topology for the guests. Uh, so this is something that um, Elena uh, Ufunseva has been working on. So we've had, had an intern from the GNOME outreach program for WIM. And um, uh, this is a fairly a large project, um, but it involves um, having a, a virtualized way to tell um, the guest about uh, NUMA topology. Um, and we're targeting that, that for 4.4. Um, again, who knows, if it, who knows if it's gonna get in, but it looks um, possible, probable. Uh, the last thing we wanna be able to look at, so right now, once you've placed a VM, 
and the memory is there, it's basically stuck there for the rest of the, the thing. And the only way to actually change it is to move it, migrate it to a completely different host, and then migrate it back, right? And so we are looking at um, code which allows you to move the memory of a VM from one NUMA node to another so that as VMs are created and destroyed and moved around, you can say, you know what, when, when I created this, I needed to have this memory across two nodes. But right now, um, I can actually consolidate this so all the memory can be on one node, and then this VM can have better performance. So um, uh, Dari has been working on that, um, but uh, as we said, status tentative. So we'll see when, um, when that gets there. Okay, so that's all I have. Um, are there any questions? No questions at all. Neil? Do we need to have hang up? I can just work. I, I, I can project. Oh, okay. Well, I, I can try and repeat too. Great. A lot of the new uh, protocol work in, uh, in uh, NetFront and BlockFront look very useful, but do you know how um, they're being adopted in Amazon and Rackspace and so on? When can you start using them on public cloud infrastructure? Right, so the question was, um, we have a lot of new protocol improvement in the net front and block, um, net front and, uh, block front, and um, do I know when those things are going to be available on public cloud infrastructure? And um, I don't. Uh, does anyone want to answer that? What's that? It does not, not need to be in the server. Right, OK. Um, yeah, so it, 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 it'll, it'll, it'll get there, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. Um, yes, in the back. Uh, what's the status of nested support? Nested support, right. So, um, oh, he was supposed to send me some slides. Anyway, um, <laughs> so. Um, from my mem as, so is there anyone here from Intel who can answer that question authoritatively? No. Oh, sorry. Uh, well, yeah, I guess I can say a word on that. Um, the situation has certainly improved over what we should put for the three. Mm. We tried to put important bug fixes back into for the three so they will be in for three one. Mm. Yeah. So, so one thing is, um, it's heavily dependent on the. Uh, so, it, um, it, it's implemented completely differently. It's a completely different set of code for SVM, AMD versus Intel. Um, so, AMD, I think, was the first one to have their stuff in, um, but uh, they haven't been able to work in development as much uh, recently. Um, whereas the Intel uh, does have some people that are consistently working on improving it, um, and so. As of recently, um, the uh, one um, the th there have been some significant improvements um, in the Intel code recently since the 4.3 release, um, and in particular, the uh, the guys started testing um, the Windows 7 XP compatibility mode, which is one thing that many people want want to be able to do for desktops. Um, so uh, I think it's getting better. Um, I'm not sure we have a way of, of saying exactly when, when this can move from um, uh, sort of experimental tech preview feature into now this is an officially supported feature. Um, but it's definitely getting, um, getting much better. Um, and as Jan said, we uh, um, have backported quite a number of the improvements from uh, the, in recently into, into back into 4.1, 4.3.1. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this is, sorry, just to make sure, so, so um, uh, Libvirt is a project not run by, run, not run by Zen. Um, it's actually developed by uh, Red Hat. And um, it's prime, Libvirt's, in theory, what Libvirt is supposed to do is to be a, a generic library that can access any um, backend virtualization thing. So it has backends for 
I think it has backends for Hyper-V, for VMware, for plain QEMU, for um, things like that. But in practice, because um, almost the entirety of Libvirt is developed by Red Hat, and Red Hat's focus is on KVM, um, basically Libvirt is very, very, very focused, just, by, just because of that, the, the, there's the sort of the forces the way things work um, on KVM. So Libvirt works, um, and, and Libvirt is actually used in um, Overt and a number of the other Red Hat technologies. So Libvirt is on the critical path for Red Hat for KVM. Um, so it is, uh, but Zen is slightly different. Most people using Zen um, use either sort of, we have a, a separate tool stack um, um, that's focused on Zen. So Excel, um, the older one is Zendy, or if you're using Zen server or something like that, you can use um, uh, Zappy, right? Um, so as far as, uh, so PCI passed through for Zen, using the Zen tool stack has been around for a long time, um, and it's already supported. Uh, does that make sense? Um, and actually the, um, and Zen server has had a certain level of support for PCI passed through for a while, and they have a lot of things um, uh, with the uh, NVIDIA graphics pass through and things like that. That's a, a feature that's coming up in the, the Zen server one. So what this is about is allowing PCI pass through to go through Libvirt. So if you want to use Libvirt for some reason, or if you want to use um, any of the, there's a lot of number of graphical front ends that use Libvirt, um, then at the moment you can't use PCI pass through via Libvirt, but soon you should be able to. Um, and one of the things that Libvirt support should, should be helpful with, um, uh, OpenStack, for instance, would prefer you to use Libvirt rather than having a separate um, library for Zen support. Um, also, there's a number of graphical front ends that um, are sort of nice to use, um, and uh, if we can get liver, better liver support, that means we can send, people come to us and say, you know, I, I want to use Zen, um, but I would like one of these graphical front ends or something like this. We can say, well, here's what you do. You, you download this graphical front end and use Libvirt, and you can use Zen for that. Um, that's why Libvirt is, is, is important. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah. Oh, right, right, right. Okay. <coughs> Libvirt for LibXL. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay. I must have filtered that out. When I <laughs> Or maybe having a, a blog post on it at some point. So, okay. Um, I guess I mean while we're at so Zendi, one thing um, we have been discussing, and, and for, for a long time we've been discussing um, remo removing Zendi from the tree. Um, so there are a number of things which um, have been identified. We're going to have a list now of things which are are in Zendi that are not in in LibXL or not supported well with LibXL um, that need to be addressed. And we say when we have knocked all these things off, then we will consider removing Zendi from the tree. So if you are currently using Zendi and relying on Zendi, um, uh, I encourage you to try Excel. Um, for the most part, it should be just a drop-in replacement. You just take, you just change your XM commands into Excel commands and it should all work. If it doesn't work, please let us know um, so that we can try and add 
the things you need to our list of things to get implemented before we remove Zendy. Um, okay, any other questions? Great, thank you.